in the last lecture we discussed the principle of a capacitor we found that we, if we have a charged plate and bring another charged plate uncharged plate or uh, negatively or oppositely charged plate then the potential of this plate gets reduced and it can store more charge so that is the principle of a capacitor and we learned that when capacitors are in series that is the positive of one joint to the negative and the positive of the other to the negative and so on they are in series then the total capacity gets reduced when they are in parallel that is positive plate of one joint to the positive plate of the other negative plate of the one joint to the negative plate of the other then the capacity increases we also did a few problems and we found that if we have a if we have two charged capacitors we join them then the there is a loss of energy and this energy goes mostly as heat now in this lecture we we shall take up the question of the motion of charges in a metallic wire and you know the motion of charges constitutes a current so we start with electric current so first of all let us see the nature of conduction in metals you know that metals are very high densities the number of atoms per unit volume is very very large of the order of 10 to the power 30 and they get crushed the all the atoms they get crushed against each other with the result that a few electrons i have shown here they become delocalized that means they do not belong to any particular atom and these electrons can move if there is a potential difference across and these electrons are called free electrons now during its motion inside a conductor an electron collides continuously with the atoms at each collision the electron changes its course so its motion is truly random if we focus attention on any cross section of a conductor there is no net flow of electrons in any direction let me show you this first here here i have a piece of wire a metallic wire and i have the motion of electrons when there is no electric field applied when there is no potential difference applied now the electrons move in random directions and if i choose this cross section there is no flow of electrons either to the left or to the right and this is how the things happen here we have one electron this electron collides with this atom changes direction collides with this atom changes direction and so on ultimately it comes here and there is no net displacement of electrons the electron keeps colliding and on an average it remains at the same place here i have removed the atoms and i have shown you the kicks that each electron gets as it collides with an atom so you can see this is random motion and there is no possibility of any displacement now i apply an electric field then the electron feels a force in a direction opposite to that of the field the field is in this direction and the electrons get a kick in the opposite direction get acceleration in the opposite direction and now what happens on each of these vectors which were random i am now adding a systematic component to the right so what happens is that we get this that there is now slight displacement of electrons so when an electric field is applied then there is collisions of course continue but on top of collisions we have now a directional motion of the electrons random but directional motion of the electrons so they move in a direction opposite to the electric field and you can see as they move they also collide but because of the electric field there is net displacement of electrons we say that the electrons are drifting in the direction opposite to the electric field because of this drift there is now a net flow of electrons towards the end of the conductor which is at a higher potential this is a higher potential so the electrons are moving towards this you can see the motion is still random this flow constitutes the electric current electric current is as you know flow of charges the collisions which impede the motion of electrons 
gives rise to resistance of the conductor. So, these collisions they they impede the motion of the electron and therefore, it is called resistance they resist they apply resistance to the motion of electrons. If we apply very strong electric field then all the electrons move almost orderly, but if we do not have a strong electric field then the motion is like this random motion. And in this circuit when there is a flow of current through the wires then there is a current uh, flow of current to the bulb and the bulb gets lighted bulb gets glows. The measure of the current is the charge that flows across a cross section of the wire in one second. Let me go back to this. I have chosen this cross section and I find the number of electrons moving through this cross section and then the rate at which the electrons move across this cross section is the current the flow of charge per second. Remember that this is only when electric field is very strong otherwise the motion is random even then through a cross section the electrons drift and therefore, the flow of charge through any cross section per second is called current. So, I can define mathematically current as delta q by delta t and in the limit of delta t going to 0 this becomes d q by d t. So, the current is d q by d t. The SI unit of charge is coulomb you know that its symbol is capital C. The unit of current is called an ampere and its symbol is capital A and 1 ampere is 1 coulomb of current flowing through any cross section every second. The fundamental unit of charge we have seen earlier also is an electron which has charge given by this number and one of the wonders of nature is that charge on the proton is exactly equal to that of the electron. So, the protons inside the nucleus they can exactly cancel the charge due to an equal number of electrons outside the nucleus. So, therefore, the atom is completely neutral without any charge and if the charge exists then it is always an integral multiple of either electron charge or proton charge. We do talk of quarks, quarks are the constituents of particles like neutrons and protons and inside these neutrons and protons quarks exist which are thought to have charge which is fractional, but outside these particles the charge is always an integral unit of this charge, integral multiple of this charge. We have seen how an electron collides with atoms as it drifts through the wire. The time between two successive collisions is obviously not equal. So, what we do is we take a average, but since the number of electrons is very large this average is equal to the average of average times for all electrons. That is if you take all the electrons find the average time between collisions then take their average that is the the average time between two collisions and this is called relaxation time and it is denoted by this Greek letter tau. The distance travelled by the electron during this time which is the same as the average distance travelled by it between successive collisions is called the mean free path. See there is average time between two collisions and there is also the average distance between the two collisions this is called the mean free path. Once again we take average of averages of all electrons and we find the mean free path and the speed with which the electrons drift is called the drift speed. So, it can be shown again because of the large number of electrons that the average drift speed of an electron is the same as the average of average drift speeds of all the electrons. So, we denote the average drift speed by V d. If E is the magnitude of the electric field intensity, then the force experienced by an electron is E e. And if M e is the mass of the electron, then the acceleration it acquires is A e by M e. And since this is the acceleration in time tau, which is the average time between two collisions, it acquires a speed which is given by V d the drift speed and it is equal to 
E E by M E times tau. Consider now a conductor in which the electrons are drifting to the right with the speed V D. So, this is how the electrons drift and I have this piece of wire and I have chosen a cylindrical region with a length equal to V D. So, that all the electrons present right from this point they can cross this cross section A in 1 second. So, I have chosen this length of the cylinder equal to V d. So, that in 1 second all the electrons in this they will cross this cross section. So, what is the charge that crosses this? The number of electrons in this is A is the area of cross section, V d is the length therefore, A times V d is the volume and if the number density is n then A times n times V d is the number of electrons and if I multiply this by the charge of the electron then that is the charge that comes out through cross section A. So, that charge is E n A V d and therefore, the current because this is a charge that comes out every second therefore, the current is E n A V d and we can express this current as a function of E. We have already found V d as function of E which is V d equal to E e by m e times tau. So, we substitute this and we get i equal to e squared n a tau by m e times e. So, the current comes out to be proportional to the electric field and electric field is due to the potential difference. Therefore, the current we shall see in a moment is proportional to the potential difference. So, as expected the current in a conductor is proportional to the strength of the electric field applied along the conductor. So, if L is the length of the conductor and V is the potential difference across this conductor then the field is V by L and we will substitute E equal to V by L and we get I equal to E squared N A tau by M E L times V. That means, I can write I equal to V by R where R now is M E times L by E squared N A tau and you see two things R is proportional to the length of the conductor and it is inversely proportional to the area of cross section of the conductor. And this relation I equal to V by R is known as Ohm's law, you know it very well. And the resistance has this expression. This gives an insight into the mechanism for the conductor offering resistance to the flow of current. The collisions between the electrons and atoms that provides the resistance to the flow of current. And since resistance is proportional to L and inversely proportional to A, therefore, I can write R as rho times L by A, where rho now the specific resistance which is the characteristic of a of a material is also called resistivity of the material and this is given by M E by E squared N tau. This is a characteristic of the material, it does not change, you change the length, you change the cross section it does not change. Specific resistance or resistivity they are characteristic of a material they do not change and the reciprocal of rho is called the conductivity of the material. Equation I equal to E n A V d can now be used to estimate the drift speed. So, V d is I by E n A. So, I allow a certain current and then I know the area of cross section, I know E, I know the density in that material therefore, I can find V d and turns out the V d is of the order of only 10 to the power minus 5 meters per second of the order of very small quantity 10 to the power minus 5 meters per second. That means, that the electrons drift extremely slowly. How can then any meaningful current ever be established in a conductor? Remember that the current is charged per unit time and even if the time each electron takes to pass through a cross section is very large because of the drift is so slow the number of them passing through the cross section is extremely large you see 10 to the power 30 atoms per meter cube and a large number of them can pass through a cross section even if they drift very slowly. So, a current can be established. How is that the light of the bulb comes on instantaneously this is the question we often debate as soon as we 
put the switch in the on position, the bulb glows immediately. How does this happen? Let us see. The signal of the electric field may be likened to the command of a military general. You see, let me go back a little. As soon as the potential difference or electric field is established, all these electrons are ordered. Who orders them? The electric field, the signal travels with the velocity of almost velocity of light, the signal that each electron now start moving. And how do they just like the soldiers, I mean a general gives a command and soldiers wherever they are, they start moving. The signal that the electric field sends out to the electrons to start drifting travels in the conductor with nearly the speed of light and reaches wherever it may have to reach, reaches in a very, very short time, almost instantaneously. Therefore, whenever switch is put in the on position, the light, the bulb glows because the time taken, even if the bulb is, let us say, several uh, meters away, it does not matter. The time taken is very short. The signal travels with the velocity of light. And therefore, the current flows immediately and we have the bulb glowing. You are often asked why the bulb glows immediately. The electrons do reach, but one electron is not sufficient to, to make the bulb glow. So, what happens is this. Once the electrons start drifting, the electrons nearest to the bulb gets into its filament, then the next nearest and so on. So, the each one starts drifting to the bulb and when sufficient number reaches the bulb, the bulb starts glowing. It is like opening a water tap. The uh, tap is somewhere else and we have a, let us say, a, a, a tube. Then what happens? As soon as we open the tap, the water starts coming out of the tube. No, it does not wait for that water which uh, is near the tap to come here. Whatever water was here, it starts flowing, next one, next one and so on the water starts flowing. Same is the case with the current. The electron nearest to the bulb goes into the filament, then the next, then the next, then the next and when uh, a large number goes through the bulb, then the current is set up and the bulb flows. It must therefore be understood that as soon as the electric field or electric potential is set up in a circuit, the current starts flowing. This we have discussed. The potential difference is established when there is an unbroken connection between the two terminals of the battery. That is important. We have a here key. If the key, key can be anywhere, but if the key is not in the on position, then the circuit is broken and therefore, the current does not flow. Unless the, the circuit is unbroken, that is the key is in the on position, these two points are joined, the current will not flow. Where this key can be, it does not matter, it can be anywhere. As long as it is open, no current flows. If it is closed, then the current flows and the things happen. If I plot I against V, if I establish a certain potential difference across a wire, and find out the current, then this is the graph I get and the slope of this graph is 1 by r because v is i times r or i is v by r. Therefore, this slope is 1 by r. And these devices which have this linear relation between i and v, they are called ohmic devices. Ohmic is from Ohm's law. So, they are called ohmic devices because they obey Ohm's law. Non-ohmic devices, when the relationship between i and v is not linear as in this case. This is a p-n junction. There the relation between i and v is not linear. Therefore, it is a non-ohmic device. If I combine resistances one after the other, they are said to be in series and in fact, they constitute one whole long conductor and therefore, the resistances are added. Here we have resistance R1, R2, R3. They are all in series. The current flows through this R1, then through R2, then through R3. It is not divided. It does not get divided anywhere. So, it flows through R1, R2, R3. R1, R2, R3 are said to be in series. And potential difference across R1 is I R1, across R2 is I R2, across R3 is I R3 and some of these must be equal to the total potential difference. And therefore, the effective resistance is V 
by the effective current i and therefore, the effective resistance is just the sum of the resistances in series. When there is a division of current as it happens at point A, some current goes to R 2, some goes to R 3, then R 3 and R 2 are said to be in parallel, R 2 is parallel to R 3 and whatever the effective resistance of this is in series with R 1. And since the potential difference across these two is the same, therefore, I have current through this is V by R 2, current through this is V by R 3 and the total current is V by the sum of these two currents and therefore, if I substitute the values V A B by R effective, R effective is the resistance of the parallel combination that is the potential difference which is equal across R 2 plus V A B by R 3. Therefore, R effective is given by this expression. So, in parallel combination the resistances have effective resistances given by this formula and the resistance gets reduced in fact. In this lecture we have seen first how the free electrons flow through a wire. You know there are a lot of collisions and they flow randomly, but when an electric field is applied they get a, a drift in the in the direction not electrons get drift uh, in the direction opposite to that of the electric field and they constitute the current. And the collisions between electrons and atoms they provide the, the resistance to the flow of current and the resistances when they are one after the other they are said to be in series they are added up when they are parallel that it means that there is a division of current through the two resistances. They are in parallel and their value is given by the effective value is given by 1 by r effective equal to 1 by r 1 plus 1 by r 2 plus 1 by r 3 and so on and we can work out what r effective would be. The res net result is that r effective is less than either of the resistances in parallel arrangement. In the next lecture will continue with this, this discussion of current electricity.